Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast, My First Season. My name is Greg. Very special guest today. According to Facebook, we have 53 mutual friends in common. He's a good friend uh, of mine, of Johnny Scuba, who you remember earlier from in the podcast. His first season was in Sandpiper, Florida in October of 1991. Get this, as a mini club scuba, which I'm very curious to hear about. The one, the only, please give it up for Dan Beeman. Hey Dan, how are you, sir? <laughs> the one, the only, the one, as I used to say, the man, the myth, the legend, well, judging by the, the self-described uh, legend. I know, I know. I'm going to have to get Johnny Scuba to get me some stories about you. Um, <laughs> he, may, he may have told me back then in 94 in Turks, but uh, I'm not sure if I remember much that season. I was drinking a lot of beer back then, so uh, memories are hazy, but uh, any any friend of Johnny's, as they say, is a friend of mine. <laughs> so uh, Turks, you can... and, Turks and Caicos, wow. Great yeah. memories there. Yeah, uh, but yours, yeah, I'm kind of interested. Uh, well, let's get let's back up a bit because I, um, you were on another podcast. Not many of my guests go on other podcasts, but you did, and you were on the Pickleball Fire podcast, which we're going to get into. And if I recall, you said right out of high school you joined the U.S. Army. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. What made you do that? Well, um, I was looking. I had um, five older siblings that were all in college. And dad said, uh, Daniel, your grades aren't quite cutting it. You need to figure out your own solution for college. And so I looked around and said, huh, the services, why not serve my country? And they can help me fund my college education, which they did. All right. Now, did you decide airborne, airborne paratrooper or did they put you there? Well, I was a swimmer in high school. And uh, so I was pretty fit. And when I got into basic training, those of us that uh, excelled in the physical fitness testing were invited to do airborne school. And so I was invited to do it. And, and it was an incredible experience. And then the, after airborne school, they said, great, you are now an airborne paratrooper. Would you like to do ranger school? And I thought to myself, I think that's where you got to go out in the woods and fend for yourself and not eat or sleep for about a week. And I thought, no, it's okay. I'll just stick with the airborne stuff. Can I back you up a second? Of course. If you're if you were a good swimmer, did you not think of being a navy diver, a navy swimmer? You know those that go to the deep sea rescues there in the ocean and help capsize boats and all that. Did you not think of that? Actually, that's a great question. In airborne school, I met a bunch of navy steel, navy seals, and people talk about the uh, special forces and other things. Navy seals are the baddest people I've ever met. They were incredible. I was in perfect shape, and they were in better shape. But the interesting thing was when I enlisted, the enlistment opportunity in 1982 was you could either do two years of uh, active duty and then four years of inactive duty or four years of active duty, and they would give an $8,000 bonus. And when I enlisted and I was 18 years old, I thought to myself, wow, uh, most of my friends are probably going to be on five-year plans in college. So if I do two years and I can do college in three years, I can actually catch up with all of my friends and graduate approximately the same time they did with a free education, thanks to the military. And that's what I did. I did college in three and a half years. Okay, do you, rem do you remember your first jump out of a perfectly good airplane? <laughs> I do, because uh, the chute automatically opens when you jump out in airborne school. So they don't rely on you to pull oh. the plug to have the, the uh, chute open. And they taught us that you're supposed to count to three and the chute opens. And I remember instead of counting to three, I said, please open now. <laughs> uh, this is on what they call as a static line. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now, just to fast forward, out, just a little bit. How many do you call approximately how many jumps you did with your years? Yes. In the airborne? So uh, I did, uh, I did basic training in Fort Benning, Georgia, and then I did airborne school there as well. And we did five jumps, a total of five jumps. And then I was assigned to what they call a leg unit or a non-airborne unit for the rest of my enlistment. And that was in Germany. And so I never did an, another dive, another jump since then. Really? Okay. Did they have you do any, um, did part of the training include a night jump? It did. Yeah, um, that was crazy. What's, what's that like? <laughs> well, night scuba diving is a lot more fun. Let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> um, and the other thing about, about airborne school and military jumps is um, they want you to jump from as low as possible. So we did a jump that was from, if I remember correctly, only 800 feet at night. 
So if you can imagine you're 800, jumping, 800 yeah. Feet. So oh. you're landing pretty well. Think about it. If yeah. in, in, in battle, you don't want to be hanging out up there, you know, as a, a sitting duck, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's it's basically as a, as a, actually I met a I worked with another XGO uh, who was scuba instructor as well, also in airborne as you. And uh, do you know Tim Wilcox by any chance? I don't think so. Oh, okay. Unless, unless he was a guy named Tim Scuba, and I knew him by that name. Oh, okay. He had long blonde hair. He had the biggest, <laughs> biggest calves, biggest calves you've ever seen. Skinny guy, but biggest calves, and he had a silver surfer tattoo on one of his calves. Did you? Did, no. Is this the same guy? Uh, no, I no? laugh. Okay. At, I laugh at long blonde hair because uh, well, I guess I'll get to that story. Okay. But you can imagine. Okay. Most scuba instructors <laughs> had the long blonde hair. Yeah, that's and true. And interestingly okay. enough, on Johnny, Johnny all served. So we're the exact same yes. age. And yes. he served in the Navy and I served in the army. So we had that That's commonality right. as well. That's right. That's right. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I can talk to you more about paratrooping. All right. So you finish your, um, you, you finish your school year. So how do you find out about club med? And actually, um, well, what, well, wait a minute. when did you get in, certified to be an instructor? Was that before club med? I'm guessing. No, that, that's another great story. Oh, okay. I, so I got, I graduated in college, like I said, in three and a half years. And then I went, I was a president of the triathlon club in college, and we did a indoor triathlon at Eastern Illinois University, where we raised money and competed. And I thought, this is so fun. I want to be in the special events business. So I contacted the race director of the Chicago triathlon my senior year and went and interned for him that summer, and then opened up my own sports business consulting practice, where I advised amateur athletic events on how to drive incremental revenue through corporate competitions and their events. Sorry for the marketing speak. And then went on to work for the Multiple Sclerosis Society and was their special events manager and organized their bike tours. And one of my friends during that period went on vacation at Club Med and came back and said, dude, this is for you. And at the time I was living in a high rise condo on the waterfront in Chicago and when I got the app, when he told me about that Club Med experience, it was February in Chicago. And I remember walking home from working out one night and the wind blew off the lake, a tear rolled out of my eye and froze on my cheek. And I said, I think this Club Med thing is something I should pursue. All right. That's yeah. Usually the cold has something to do with it. <laughs> yeah. you, you being from Chicago, me being from Montreal. Yeah, that was the deciding factor. All right. And okay, so ninety one. Um, so so I, I I can keep going. So then yeah, I, yeah, I, please I, do. I applied for the job. Uh, let's see. I sent in a letter, never responded. Then sent in a FedEx next day, never responded. Then found a friend of a friend who knew a friend that had a connection internally, and then secured an interview. I was remember in Chicago at the time in the winter, and I secured an interview in New York City. So I flew out to New York City without any promises on my own dime, stayed at a friend's place, got the interview, and uh, the interview was pretty funny as well. Now, was this a one-on-one type interview, or did they make you do crazy signs or tell jokes on stage? <laughs> they, uh, well, it, it was really interesting. I thought they did a great job. They had us sit in a circle, and, and it, so it was a group interview, and they gave a little quick overview about Club Med, and they said, okay. So why don't we go around the room and, and everyone introduce yourselves. And intuitively, I just raised my hand first and said, hi, I'm Dan. I love sports. I'm a swimmer and I'd love to work at this place called Club Med. And uh, they went around the room. And I think by raising my hand and going first and being you know, outgoing and volunteering information about myself, I kind of got it going. And if you have that sort of personality, that's sort of organic for the lifestyle of Club Med. Okay. But at, th- at this point, you're not a certified scuba instructor yet? I was certified. Well, that, that the rest of the interview gets funny. Oh, so okay. <laughs> they go off into the individual interviews. You know, they kind of, I, I wanted to do land sports. And then uh, I got into the inter- individual interview. Oh, I wish I could say her name. She was a recruiter. She was wonderful. She was so funny. And so I sit down with her and she said, okay, you want to do land sports? I said, yeah, you know, but I also swam competitively. She said, swam, really? Okay. Tell me more. And I said, well, I swam and I was a, I'm a triathlete and I was certified in scuba as a, for a PE course in college. She said, certified in scuba, really? Tell me more about that. I said, well, I'm really a natural in the water. I love the water and I love being in the water and anything water related is fun for me. And she said, okay. And how's your French? And I said, 
Well, I took a year of it in high school. She said, all right, well, let's talk in French. Then I said, no, that's not happening. And she said, okay, we'll say something in French. And I said, voulez-vous coucher avec moi? Oh, boy. And <laughs> from the old song. Yes, from the song, the song, yeah. yes. And so she said, all right, well, that's a start. She said, here's what we got. We have a, a, a scuba position for little kids in a pool in Sandpiper, Florida. And we need someone immediately. Can you can you can you be there next, you know, I don't know what in another week? And I said, Well, I'm 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 fully employed right now at the Multiple Sclerosis Society. So I can't be there in a week, but I could go back and give my notice and be there maybe in two. She said, Okay, we'll send you the information you're in. So that was my interview, and I began to do mini club scuba, which was one of the coolest jobs ever in Club Med. I had such a blast with it, and I'd love to tell you more about it. So do you recall arriving that first week at all, your first season in Sandpiper? I do. I remember that they were, I think they were just building the GEO building, and so I stayed in a GM room with a couple of other people, and I remember, you know, it was it was kind of foreign to me in that the social dynamic was so fast and there was so much going on that it took a bit to get adapted to so many people that were so outgoing and such a fast paced lifestyle, but I adapted pretty quickly. Did the uh, interviewer recruiter tell you about like the seven days a week and the hours and no days off? Did they, did they mention that at all to you in that interview? It's, you know, this is going back, what, 30 years. Oh, by the way, I remember her name was MJ Foreman. And I think she's kind of a legend in the interviewer in Club Med. I don't, re I don't recall all of that, but I adapted quickly. This was all, this all lined up perfectly with me because I'm pretty outgoing and I love the sport. So when I wasn't in the pool with the kids, I was playing volleyball or basketball or water skiing or golfing or tennis or running or, you know, you name it. I, I love doing all the activities. You recall who your chief of village was that, that year? Bernard Vigier. Okay, I've heard of him. All right. Okay. He was he was wonderful, but even more important and impactful on my life was Teach Scott Teach Mayor. Teach was I was 27 when I started. Teach was just out of college. So I want to say he was 23. He got a degree from Harvard and he spoke fluent French and he was the chief of the mini club. And I believe this was his second season. So he was promoted after just one season to the chief of mini club and went on to a great career with Club Med as a chief of village and a lifetime friend of mine. All right. So you're getting, so did you actually want to change your position at all? Like, look, because you know, you, you want to do land sports and I, you just told me you did a lot of, you did a lot of everything, water sports and land sports. Did you, did you, how long was your first season? If you arrived in October, did you uh, do a season until like April of the following year? Uh, funny story. Yes, I did. I, I, I loved what I did. I made it theatrical. So if you can visualize Sandpiper, that lap pool right by the mini club. So this is, remember, mini club scuba is aged four to 12 year olds. So if you can imagine a four year old with a miniature tank mask fins doing scuba in a pool and their parents standing around watching, at first it was fraught with challenges and you know teaching kids to breathe out of this weird apparatus and half of them couldn't even really swim. So I learned a trick. There was a son of a ex-chief of village who was living there, who was six years old. And um, he was my kind of, uh, I, I cheated with him because he was an excellent swimmer, totally comfortable in scuba. So I'd always have him go first. And I learned quickly that fear is learned and this kid would succeed. So the other kids would see him and then they would succeed. So he was kind of my guinea pig and made it all easier, but man, it was so much fun to see these kids with their eyes open underwater, seeing this stuff and breathing off this apparatus. And it was a, it was, a, it was an absolute blast. I loved it. So you, were you there a full six months? I was there six months. And then after the six months, I rotated off for my two weeks vacation. I went back to Chicago and the two weeks became three weeks and three weeks might have even become four. And I called back to Club Med and said, what's up? Where am I going? They said, well, bad news is we don't have any other positions for you. Good news is you can come back and do the same thing. So it may be fairly unique that someone that was worked at Sandpiper voluntarily went back to Sandpiper to do the exact same job for another six months. 
And I even had more fun in the summer because I got to meet the Trigono family and teach a lot of their extended family this little mini club scuba experience. And needless to say, befriending them was important and impactful on the rest of my career with Club Med. Okay, let me just jump a bit ahead. I'm going to get back to your first season. At what point then did you decide to become a scuba instructor? So that's one of the stories, uh, as I laughed when you talked about the blonde hair. Okay. So I remember I'm the scuba instructor in, in the mini club at Sandpiper, and, ex and geos rotate and go on vacation at other villages. And some scuba instructors came to Sandpiper as their vacation. And let's see if I can remember. One of them was Dano. Another one was Hollywood. And these guys were like these buffed out bleach blonde hair with the tattoos and the earrings. And I thought they were the coolest guys ever. I'm like, wow, you guys are scuba instructors. I want to do that. And they kind of gave me the path one night over dinner and Club Med supported me and paid for me to get my advanced open water and my rescue diver while I was still in Sandpiper. We did it in the port in the St. Lucie River that was also filled with a bunch of either alligators or crocodiles. Well, wait, yeah. What's the visibility like in the St. Lucie River? How, how, okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. So Club Med actually paid for, for that? Yeah. And it was, again, I befriended the Trigono family. I told them of what my objectives were. And Greg Snyder was the chief of the village that season and he supported it as well. So I got to do both of those. And then, you know, the natural progression, my assignment was to be, after I got my advanced and rescue divers to go to Turks and Caicos, where I was assigned as the snorkeling and picnics guy, and uh, also got to get my dive master during that same time period. Okay, I see. So you could have, I guess, technically, you could have gone to a place and, and did it in a month, though, right? All in one shot, right? Is that like when you uh, when you go to ocean divers, say in Florida, you, you could, can, can you get a, the instructor in about a month intensively or no? Well, it's a progression. You can't get okay. your instructor until you get, so it starts it's open water, then advanced open yeah. water, then rescue diver, and then, I don't know, deep diver, or something else, then dive master, then instructor. So you got to go through the progression. So I did the first two or three while I was still in, in Sandpiper, and then the dive master in Turks and Caicos. Could you, could, is it physically possible to do this in a month or no? All of those? I don't no? think so. I, oh, okay. It took at least 10 days to do the instructor school, if I remember correctly. And the dive master is, you know, a lot of hours of, you know, working in support of the instructors. So I, it's a bunch of dives and a bunch of training that I did all in Turks and Caicos. And it was convenient because, of course, they had a great dive team there. And I was doing the snorkeling and picnics. So, you know, after work, I would do the dives with the, with the instructors and do that training. So you were doing snorkeling picnic in Turks and Caicos? Yes. Would this be in 92-ish or...? Yeah, so I did, okay. let's see, uh, 92, 93, yes. Okay, wow. Got any JoJo stories? I do. I, I, that was one of the motivations to go. I had been there about a month. I'll never, ever, ever forget this. And I had not seen JoJo. Michelle was a French-Canadian boat captain. What a trip he was. Yeah. And we came back from a snorkel one day, and people were all on the pier pointing and saying, there's JoJo. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I grab a, my fins and mask and dive in. And at that point, I had crazy, crazy lung capacity uh, because I was free diving down during snorkeling sessions and pointing out fish and showing people and coming up. And so I got in and swam with Jojo and I was trying to find him. And every time I would come up for air, the people on the pier were like, he's right behind you. And after four or five times, this, I'm like, oh, he's messing with me. So then I went down and then we proceeded for the next 45 minutes to play a game of chase where I swam, then I would turn around and he'd swim and he'd turn around. And it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. I got to do that with him another 20 to 25 times in the next six months. And we became friends because I never, ever tried to touch Jojo. So there was almost a certain respect because I'd heard of people that reached out and Michelle, the boat captain said, don't try to touch him. So then I learned tricks from Michelle about shaking the chain on the mooring of the boat and doing things that Jojo was interested in that were sound related. And so we just had a, 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 I feel like we developed a phenomenal relationship and something I'll never forget. Yeah, it's definitely a, definitely a highlight. If you've ever get the chance to swim with a wild dolphin, it's amazing <laughs> for sure. 
Wow. Okay. Let's, uh, did you get any kind of culture shock whatsoever when you first started at Sandpiper? I mean, I don't know if there was a lot of Europeans back then, but did anything shock you at all culture wise or no? You know what? Not really. If you think about this, uh, my first season, it was a winter season. So it's mostly Americans. And I had grown up uh, on the West side of Chicago and was a swimmer at a country club. So I had a background in, in swimming and golf and tennis. And so if, if you think about it, it's almost like a country club environment at Sandpiper with those same sports and all English speaking people. The second season, you know, was more challenging because I had to speak more French and there was, you know, it was a little bit of a different culture in that, you know, the American parents, when they would uh, come for the kids doing scuba for the first time, tended to want to be involved, so to speak, like they were, you know, hovering sort of parents, whereas the French parents <laughs> seem to, all right, here's my kids. I got, I'm going to go play. I'm going to go have fun. So a little different parenting style between the two seasons. All right. Now, was it in your first season that you found out if you were a good dancer or a bad one? Did the choreographer come at you hard to get you to dance in the shows? I, I think I established myself as a backline kind of guy pretty right, quickly. Right, right by the curtain, you mean? <laughs> yeah, as far back as possible. Okay, got it. But the beauty of Club Med and the shows is that, you know, the, the guests get to know the workers and you become friends over the course of a day or two or three or the week. And so it's more entertaining and laughing and seeing your friend up there embarrassing himself trying to keep pace with the, the other dancers on stage. So we had a lot of fun with it. We didn't take ourselves too seriously. And I think that was more entertaining for the guests than anything. All right. At what point did you meet Johnny Scuba for the first time? Before I get to that, I want okay, to sure. you one quick, uh, yeah. I wanted to tell a story about, yeah. I'm just trying to remember it. Oh, yes. So after I got my uh, dive master in Turks and Caicos, I went back to Chicago and did my instructor training. And I had never done a dive in cold water. So I'd never really even worn a wetsuit or was familiar with that. Now I'm in Chicago in 40 degree temperature water, taking my instructor class. Which, uh, which, sorry, Dan, which, which month is this that you're in Chicago? It was early May. Oh God. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> full of, full of thermal clines there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it was in a rock quarry with, uh -oh. with horrible visibility. So it was really funny because, you know, here I am so spoiled doing all my dives in Turks and Caicos. That's right. And that's right. So, I'm, so my next assignment then is in Martinique. And I'll never forget my first class. I arrive at noon and they're like, okay, you've got a two o'clock class teaching scuba. And I'm like, okay, I guess. And I get there and, and it was about six people surrounding me and it was a club med class. So it was not the Patty or now it was a more casual style of like, um, like the resort teaching. that resort. Yes, exactly. Course? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I said, hi, everyone. My name is Dan. I'll be teaching you scuba today. First thing I want to say, blah, blah, blah. And I start speaking the English and I see this glazed look on all their eyes. <laughs> and I'm like, maybe I should start over. How many of you speak English? <laughs> and none of them raised their hands. And now my French was not very good. And I said, okay, well, um, on y va. Uh, the premier regla is uh, regardez-moi. And we went on and I taught the three rules of scuba in French. And, and then we got in the water and had a blast. So I, I learned about Club Med is that you got to really adjust on the fly and, and make it happen and have fun. And, and we did. And, and Martinique was a great experience. Well, I, I um, and, sorry, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, I recall this from my, uh, my scuba days and, and Turks with Johnny was the third rule. You have to meet your scuba instructor at the bar for drinks and buy him beer. Was that the third rule? <laughs> well, it could be, or, mine, okay. or, or okay. the first one in my case. So Johnny and I uh, met the next season in Playa Blanca. Oh, and, really? So yes, this would and, have been 93 still? or I think if I had to guess, I want to say it was... Because I met him summer 94. 94, 93, 94 in that okay. range again. That's 20 Got years it. ago, 30 years ago. And we hit it off immediately. Uh, we were roommates and we our room was, I, I, he remembers probably exactly, it was the highest, furthest point away, 100 and some stairs. But Playa Blanca was just so much fun. Yeah. You know, it was a perfect village for me. I love that it was away from a lot of the other villages. I'm sorry, from a lot of the other towns. So it's a remote location. And so the energy was tremendous there because there people weren't distracted. There was no like, let's go to Cancun to parties at night. It was, you know, we're going to make the fun in the village. 
and um, and there was a lot of Californians, so the athletes were tended to be good athletes. So we had a lot of fun with the volleyball and the basketball, and did some trapeze and tennis, and you know, again, I love doing all the sports. Wow. All right. This yeah, Playa for such a um, yeah. I know a lot of people didn't get to go and you know, missed out on that, but yeah, it's for such a uh, small village. Everything was was right there. Everything was compact. Like even the, like you said, there was nothing to do outside. So happy hour to this day. At, at, you know, my ten years in Club Med, happy hour at Playa was the biggest event I've ever seen. <laughs> people would come from all the other activities when the bartenders would ring the cowbells. You know. Um, well, a, a couple other things though. I mean. I remember just waking up, going down for breakfast, and then, you know, walking over past the uh, rock climbing wall and seeing my buddies there and giggling about, you know, what happened the night before, and then getting to scuba on that point, which was just such an iconic little scuba shack that was carved into a rock wall. It was almost like a cave. And just the, just the fun we had together. We had such a great team and johnny johnny and i made each other laugh like nobody could ever make anyone laugh we had so much fun who was your chief in playa do you remember danny stabielli the first season i actually went back there and did another season under kenton smith oh, wow uh, but you got danny two. was the chief that first and uh, our chief of sports was chris stoughton and chris was a younger guy that i knew from uh sandpiper who was way into like he geez he created more more sports shows of battles on the water and you know we we stayed pretty busy under chris but we had a, a, the scuba team had a blast and we made up a lot of fun activities and dives uh because playa was not the ideal scuba diving environment it was mostly teaching that we did there um, yeah those vis visibility wasn't great if i recall i was there in 97 but i remember the chief of scuba calling it because he was japanese he would call it the miso soup the, like <laughs> Referring to the visibility. Was that about right? <laughs> it was about right. Okay. Uh, I, you know, the other thing that I love was remember, I'm a swimmer. So I would swim over if you remember the other bays. And would um, you go so around I, that island? Would you swim around that little island in front? Did you ever not do that? around it? I'd go, I swim to the Bel Air. It was called the Bel Air in those days. Oh, yeah. And so when I had a couple hours off, occasionally I would just swim over there and, and hang out on their beach. And so there were three bays. And I got to know the owners of that other resort. Brignone's Giorgio Brignone and I taught his wife how to scuba dive so I got I became friends with the wealthy homeowners that lived up on the cliff up there okay oh yeah oh yeah that place yeah remember it well yes now in my research of you um I guess, I'm guessing this was in Turks uh you did a I guess this would have been your your personal best or or maximum depth you did a 300 foot deep water dive in the Caribbean was that at Turks Let's see where was that no that was in san salvador in the bahamas oh okay what what and, year is that and i guess i don't work there anymore so i can't get fired for doing that dive. no 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 i know be yeah, because <laughs> no i know because my first season in turks is when i learned about all this uh because I, I was a scuba gestion and people some instructors didn't have dive computers would come at me and they'd bring them back and i would see the depth on some of these <laughs> dive computers yeah far exceeding so but i was always curious like i i die but i'm just open water one like what 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 is it about going deep i just don't get it <laughs> i think there's a certain hubris of arrogance of of dive instructors and that you know part of it is testing your limits so i didn't know that i intended to go to 300 feet and and this is this is a good you know warning story about be smart i'm lucky to be alive yeah um i think i went down and i'm pretty sure i got to 250 or 280 and i was so high mm -hmm. that I was totally disoriented and I, something, uh, you know, divine intervention. I don't know what happened, but something after 300 feet at 321 said time to go up. And I did. And of course I had to do a bunch of safety stops Yeah. Uh, as I was going up and my head got clearer as I was going up. I just remember saying to myself, go slower than the bubbles, go slower than the bubbles. Don't recommend it to anyone. I'm glad to be alive. Not the smartest decision I ever made, but you know, I guess it goes down uh, as part of my legacy. So you got a bit of the rapture of the deep there type of thing, right? Oh boy! Yeah. Okay. What? What? Well, uh, a, a lot of instructors call that the hangover cure as well. Yeah. Uh, after the dive, <laughs> you just go down for a couple of minutes and 
that uh, seemed to, to cure that before coming back up. And uh, this was Columbus in 94? So let's see, I did Columbus. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I did. I did after my first season at Playa Blanca, I did Columbus. And then after Columbus, I went back to Playa Blanca for my final season. Oh, really? Oh, so overall, how many years did you stay? I want to say about three and a half. Three and a half. Uh, so okay. 90, 91 through 95. Oh, okay. Oh, that's pretty good. And it's just funny for a scuba instructor to voluntarily do Playa Blanca after Columbus Isles to go back to Playa Blanca. But I, I'm telling you, man, that village was, it was incredible. No, it was, it was. I mean, the good thing, I spent two and a half years at Columbus, but you can't beat those geo rooms, can you, right? Oh boy, that was, <laughs> that was a different world. We had, yeah, yeah. If I remember correctly, TVs, we had TVs and right. tele room, telephones Ex too. Exactly. Yeah. So it, you know, far cry from Playa. I had a, I had a massive, massive bullfrog and living in my shower in Playa. And I don't know, I kept putting him outside. I don't know how he got in there. Like <laughs> I'd go in, I'd look down. It's the same bullfrog in the corner. Like, how does he get in the door? And then I, go back, go back a second to that. I mean, that's yeah. the beauty of club med in, yeah. the, in those days was you were not distracted. Like the mo the fun you had was how you created a conversation at your dinner table. Yeah. You know, about you know, not about what you do, but what you think about things. And, you know, that's what I loved was, you know, not uh, give me the news of the day about what's going on. What do you do for a job? That was irrelevant. It was getting to know people and talking about things that they thought about, you know, and, and those were the most fun conversations. And all these times at the table with guests, did you ever come across any celebrities, celebrity run-ins, anyone, <laughs> athletes, singers? You know, I remember we played basketball at Turks and Caicos with a bunch of the New York Giants, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. I remember, was it Jerry Rice's wife at Sandpiper, maybe? And then there was, I was not a big world uh, wrestling, you know, the yeah. world, I don't know, those wrestling people, but I think it was like Hulk Hogan's ex-wife or something. I don't know. I, but okay. not, nothing, <laughs> nothing that kind of blew me away. Okay. Now, did you guys, now I know, like I said, my first job was with the scuba team and I know how much practical jokers they are. So did you guys play jokes on each other, like in, in the water or whatnot? I mean, anything? That, well, the, the, the anything? traditional stuff of, um, you know, turning off each other's valves, we thought that was funny, you know, at a hundred feet underwater, let's turn your air off. You know, okay, that's smart. But you know, those were the, the jokes. But what I did just to kind of <laughs> make it more fun on my snorkeling boat, I remember Every day as we came in, we were approaching what they call the scuba pier. If you remember in Turks and Caicos, mm -hmm. we shared that. So I'd have, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 people on my boat. And we did the, the cheer snorkel, snorkel every day, scuba, scuba. Hell no way. And that was just a little <laughs> joke that we had with them. <laughs> uh, do you have any, uh, did you click with some like certain chiefs of villages over others? Like, is there any that you really like love working for, would work uh, for again? Another great, great story. In Turks and Caicos, I can't say the name of the chief of the village, but my chief of sports was Rico Poletti. Oh, Rico yeah. is an Italian guy who was such a great dude. He got injured. I think he broke a rib. He became, he became, a, he became a chief, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great chief. And in fact, he uh, allowed me to come stay in Cancun after I left Club Med for a week or so on a side trip. I actually did with Johnny. We went to Cuba together. Really? Johnny myself and Barry the legend Greenberg all went to Cuba and that's back in 95 so that was way ahead of the curve and wow, wow that was that's another that's another great story well yeah I thought I thought Americans couldn't go to Cuba back then we couldn't so we oh, got it, it. you have to okay. ask them when you get in not to stamp your passport oh I but see. that was an incredible trip that I'm so glad we did uh, but I was talking about Rico so I'm in Turks and Caicos and I met this girl and I wanted to impress her one day during lunch. So I asked the water ski guys if I could take their boat and go look for this. What I heard was a great reef. So I took her out and we drove way, way far away. And I'm not, I don't know anything about boats at that time. And I didn't know about the two key scenario where you have one key that goes in uh, one socket and another one goes in another as a safety key. So we hit a wave and one of the keys came out and the engine died. And I didn't know, you know, I'm like, oh, the engine, I don't know how to fix an engine. I don't, here we are like two miles offshore. So I'm like, oh boy. So 
all right, we try to figure it out. We can't. Me and this girl, this GM, and I'm like, all right, you stay on the boat. I'm going to swim ashore and, <laughs> and try to get help. So I swam, you know, it must have been, I'm not kidding, two miles. And luckily enough, Rico sent out another boat that came and saved us. And I thought, okay, that's it. I'm done. I'm fired. I'm screwed. It's over. And Rico said, Dan, I know you feel bad. And I know you'll never make this mistake again. So I want you to know that I'm not going to fire you, but I know you're going to go above and beyond and do whatever I ask and be the best geo the rest of the season. And sure enough, the faith that he had in me was so rewarding that I, you know, I had an amazing season there and I was a damn good geo and we had a lot of fun. Wow. That's pretty cool, man. <laughs> a couple of people I want to mention from that season. Yes, please. Lawrence, Lawrence Tullier was the golf pro, just classic character, lives in New Orleans and had that New Orleans drawl. And he was, and he and I shared a, a moped. So he drove it 95% of the time and I, I got a 5%, but we owned a moped together. And then Mario Morissette. Mario, when Rico got injured, Mario became the chief of sports and he was the funniest French Canadian. He's like five years younger than me. He'd call me, young man, come over here. So if you get a chance, get Mario on the pod because uh, he's got a billion stories and is still a lifelong friend as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think I bet him. Yeah. He's the, yeah. He's from Montreal. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah very... And he now lives in uh, Santa Clara, California. Ugh, lucky. Why can't that have happened to me? Okay. <laughs> well, okay a quick story about Mario that I love. Yeah, sure. He, uh, he, he met his wife in uh, Ixtapa, I think. And the, she's a Californian. So they fell in love and he came back to California, married her, and was out looking for work, couldn't find work, couldn't find work. One day he walks into an ice rink and uh, says, hey, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to get a job. And they're like, well, what can you do? He's like, well, what do you need? And they said, well, can you drive a Zamboni? And he said, sure. <laughs> and so he became the Zamboni driver. Fast forward, I don't know, five years. He now owns the rink, owns a hockey club, is incredibly successful and he just parlayed that initial job as a Zamboni driver into being a very, very successful businessman. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I think everyone dreams about driving that Zamboni, you know, like <laughs> when you're from Montreal, you go to hockey games, you really want to drive that thing, man. Like, <laughs> I don't know why it's something so soothing about going around in that circle. <laughs> I just love that he parlayed, you know, his, his being a Canadian into this huge success and yeah, he's that's a, awesome. A tremendous leader of people. And the kid, you just, the power he has over these kids and influences their lives. And he's made a huge impact and, and another great guy and a lifetime friend. All right. I, I want to ask you one more club ed question. Then I want to talk about other things. Is that okay? Sure. All right. Did you find that of all the seasons you did was your first season, was that the one that was magical or if that's not a word you use or were, did you like them all the same way? Was there one that really, really stood out for you? Like, that you remember above all the others? I use the word magical because my first season was, so I was just curious if you had the same uh, feeling. Well, I, I would say this about the first season that it got me hooked into the lifestyle. So that was the magical part about it. I remember we played a lot of volleyball in those days. And I literally, when I got out of the pool, I would have a volleyball with me. And so no matter where I was walking, I had the volleyball and we would, you know, different friends, we, we call it pepper where you're hitting it back and forth. And so I remember volleyball as a passion. I also remember that the photographer, I made them a lot of money because if you can imagine the shots underwater of your kid were very successful. So they sold a lot of those pictures. So I was very good friends with them. And we obviously spent a lot of time underwater together. And the owner of the photography company uh, had a boat. So we had every other day, we would go for a run and water ski at five o'clock. Uh, the other days I played golf at five o'clock. So for me, it was like work all day. And I was not one of those nap people that nap between five and seven. I was a sport guy. So we became great friends. And that kind of set my tone for the rest of my career in Club Med was, you know what, go to bed at a reasonable hour, which means before two. And, and get up and enjoy the day. Cause that, that was the magic of club med for me is the opportunities to do all those sports. 
And after, after Club Ed, you went to graduate school. You earned a Master's of Hospitality degree from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. You studied tourism with a specialization in sustainable tourism. So if you'd like to tell everyone what you wrote your final research paper on, like what your thesis was. Yes, I would. Um, but the interesting thing is I didn't go back to graduate school until I turned 50. I said after, after. I didn't yeah, want to yeah, say yeah, the yeah. age you did. So I hoped you, uh, yeah, I, was, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to out you, Dan. I said after, after. Okay. I had a career in, in sports yes. marketing and then okay. um, went, to, went to graduate school because prior to going to graduate school, I got a gig as a general manager of a boutique luxury resort in Belize. Wow. Uh, called the Belize Ocean Club. It was a three-month contract to run their property that had just reopened after being closed for a few years. So it was an incredibly difficult three months, but also glorious. And I could not renew the contract because in a lot of Caribbean countries, you have to prove that you have a different skill set or experience or education in order to justify them for hiring a non-resident citizen of that country. So I was not able to stay in Belize and continue because I would have been in violation of their, their regulations regarding non-citizen management. So I thought, okay, well, I want to do this for the rest of my life. So I went back to graduate school and, and I did it all online through UNLV. Oh, you and did? It was a, yeah, it was a great experience. I learned so much and in my final semester, my my what my guidance counselor, that the professor of my of my final semester class, uh, asked me, you know, I said, uh, you've written a lot about sustainable tourism, you know, what else are you passionate about? Is there anything else you want to write about? I said, have you heard of pickleball? And he said, yeah, actually, I have. And he said, well, why don't you do something on pickleball and tourism? So. I wrote my professional paper on the implications of pickleball for the hospitality industry uh, as it was a new passion for me and I had a great time writing the paper. Okay, can you explain to our listeners what pickleball is? Pickleball is the fastest growing sport in America with a, a year over year growth rate of over 20%. It's a combination of ping pong and tennis played on a court the size of a badminton court utilizing a perforated plastic ball that looks like a wiffle ball and a paddle that looks like an elongated or larger ping pong paddle. And it is so fun and so addictive. And I had a blast writing the paper. The results of the paper were that any property or club or resort that has either basketball or tennis courts and doesn't at least temporarily convert them for the purpose of pickleball, they are leaving money on the table. They're not engaging their consumers to the degree that they can, and they're not having as much fun as the guests could possibly have. And so that they should at least try it. That was the conclusion. Yes. And since we both worked for an international resort that had uh, many basketball courts and whatnot, did, had you, have you ever approached Club Med about I actually brokered a deal between a, a, a paddle manufacturer and Club Med as they were trying it at a couple of their resorts. I think specifically it was Sandpiper at the time. This was in 2019. And I pitched them on, on you know, making this a significant programming. And my pitch was just as Club Med has made the flying trapeze a unique Club Med experience that people came to Club Med to do that, so could they do that for pickleball. And I think while I admire Club Med for their forward thinking, they were not forward thinking in this regard. And while some other resorts have taken it, Club Med is, is slowly getting into it. Uh, I think they have some courts at Sandpiper, Turks and Caicos. And I went to an XGO reunion in Cancun two years ago, and we actually taped the lines on a tennis court and had a bunch of people that played every day during the reunion. Oh, really? Yeah, it was a blast. Okay. Why, why is it called pickleball? <laughs> it was invented in Bainbridge, Washington, Bainbridge Island, Washington, 1965. And it was a, an ex-senator named Barry McCallum who had a dog uh, named Pickles. And oh. the kids came in one day and said that they're bored. So he invented the sport by using the existing badminton court that they had and made some wooden paddles and 
and used a, a, a plastic ball and, and taught them the game and created the rule rules over time with three of his friends that were also living in Bainbridge, Bainbridge Island at the time. Uh, and then it kind of stagnated. It was a kind of a, a school sport for a bunch of years. But then when baby boomers started retiring, it really started gaining momentum in 2018. And then 19, with the pandemic, it became a sport that everyone could do. So courts started popping up on driveways and streets, you know, people just wanting to get out and and do stuff when they were otherwise not allowed to. All right. You you love pickleball so much, an avid player. Uh, do you mind telling people what you name the place where you live? <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a quick little other story. Yes, um, yes. Is okay. I was, there's no research that you can do on pickleball 2019 when I was finishing graduate school. So I had to go to new clubs and interview people that were building a courts and interview them because there was nothing that I could look up to do the research. So I went to a place called Palm Desert Resorter in Palm Desert, California, and interviewed the general manager of a club that had just opened. Uh, they'd opened in January. I met with them in March. They had eight courts and about 50 members at the time. And now they have 24 courts and over 800 members less than three years later. As I was driving out after the interview, I saw a for sale sign in a condo about 100 yards from the courts, and I immediately made an offer on the place and moved in 10 days later. And it is called the Pickle Palace, and I I rented out uh, for seasonal rentals uh, as well. I love it. Pickle Palace. That's amazing. (laughs) And not only that, I don't know if you want to speak about it. You also wrote a screenplay, but if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. I don't want to. Absolutely do, because I'm trying to get it made. I wrote the screenplay. Uh, it's, it's, it's called Pickleballs, and it's about a, a couple of ex-tennis professionals that met in the 1979 French Open, and it, it ended in a bad way, and neither of them ever played professional tennis again. Flash forward 40 years later. They're both broken out of luck, and they decide to pair up together again, travel together in an RV across country and compete in pickleball tournaments in order to reclaim their glory and pay off their debts. It's so funny. It's a ripoff of Talladega Nights. If you could think of, you know, a mashup of Talladega Nights, Wedding Crashers, Fletch, and uh, a couple, and Step Brothers. I wrote it for Will Ferrell and Sasha Baron Cohen. One is an American capitalist ex-tennis pro, and the other is a Russian communist ex-tennis pro. And together they drive the country in an RV and learn from each other about what the true meaning of happiness is. It was a blast to write. Well, I must say you picked the, you're definitely a fan of Will Ferrell because you said the name of the character on the other podcast and you perfectly captured Will Ferrell. His name is Chip Chip Cox. Is that right? That is. That is perfectly a Will Ferrell movie. Okay, I can definitely. <laughs> so, all right. So, yeah. You his, also... par- his dad's name is Woody and his mother's name is Lovey. Okay, Lovey. Okay. <laughs> You mentioned also on this on the pickleball uh, fire podcast that and one thing I I've experienced because I I I too at one point dabbled in screenwriting the most annoying thing about Hollywood is and this is this is true <laughs> you can't get an agent unless you sell something you can't sell something unless you get an agent correct you in a, can in a nutshell you can not only not get an agent you can't speak to an agent unless you're introduced by another agent yes <laughs> and that, talk yeah. about a catch 22 I, I know is this crazy is this is insane right i mean so if there's anyone listening okay who has connections please contact dan he has a website do you want to talk about your website because i will put the link in your uh, podcast episode description but if you want to mention your website now i've also written and published two books and just submitted my third book to my editor and information about the books that i've written one is called deep dive using a metaphor for scuba diving to do uh, personal development, introspection. It it involves a bunch of existential issues. So there is a serious side to Dan Beeman. I loved writing it. I wrote that book after I wrote the buddy comedy. And my website is www. Do I need to even say that? No. Uh, (laughs) Dan, my first name, the letter B, and then M-A-N, danbman.com. And information about the Pickle Palace, my buddy comedy script that won some awards, my two books, and other stuff about me. It's all on my website. 
Yeah, yeah. And like I said, we'll be putting a link in there. Uh, are you on Instagram, Dan? I heard you say on the other podcasts, it wasn't your forte. Do you have an Instagram? Because I'll, I'll put that there I'm, too, if you want. <laughs> I'm 57 years old. So I'm more of a Facebook guy, unfortunately. No I, I do have a presence on IG, but I, I'm not very active okay. with it. Um, but Facebook is and LinkedIn, of course, as well, um, from a business perspective. All right. Before I let you go, am I forgetting to ask you anything? Is there something else you want to say? Because uh, you're being so kind with your time. I don't want to let you go unless I, you know, did I forget to ask you something? Or? Well, I hope I dropped in some nuggets. One of my favorite podcasts at the end, he always says, do you have a recommendation about a book? Another one called uh, No Smoke Podcast. It's an NBA podcast. They say, okay, thank you for being with us. Who do you recommend that we should invite for a guest on our next podcast? And can you help facilitate that? Ah. And I thought, since you are doing so many with XGOs, you should always ask that question is, what XGO would you recommend that would come on my podcast for the next one? And so I'm, I'm going to suggest that to you is that that would, I don't, I haven't, I've only listened to a few of your podcasts, but that may be a good way for you to have some continuity in the flow is like, in our last podcast, Dan Beeman recommended that we speak with Mario Morissette or or Rico Paletti, or you know, blah, blah, blah. And I think that could, you know, really have a nice thread to the narrative that you're telling in the story. Sure. Is, Mar is Mario the one you'd like to recommend? I'd recommend Mario or Rico. It, there's uh, uh, Lawrence Tellier would be fantastic. Okay. I will definitely reach out to them. And teach. Sorry, I forgot teach, about teach. Yes. Yes, I work with teach in, um, in St. Lucia. Uh, He's uh, currently the general manager of a resort in upstate New York, I believe. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay, cool. All right. And I, I, I spent some time with him in Tahiti after I left Club Med, and he was the GM there. And that, how lucky was I to do that? Yeah, yeah. No, you sound like you had a, you had a great time in Club Med, and uh, heck, even, even as a paratrooper station in Germany, it sounds like fun to me. I mean, I heard you played a lot of ping pong there, but uh, that's probably where you got so good at pickleball right i'm guessing well life is all about the exploration and doing things and living it to the fullest and you know that's why i love club med so much is that it it opened so many doors for me and enabled me to do things that i never thought i could or would do and that's kind of my mantra to my kids is like you know never stop exploring you know never limit yourself do whatever you think you want to do and that's how you really find out who you are well, we're going to end on that note, Dan, because I could not have said that better myself. That is a perfect sentiment. Thank you for that. And thanks for, for taking the time and sharing your story with us today. Hey, Greg, it was a great trip down memory lane. Thanks for having me on. Thank you all. That was Dan Beeman, and we'll see you all next week. Bye.